Hi, everybody. Welcome to another ML Talks. I'm the director, Joey Ito, of the Media Lab. And uh, uh, for all of you uh, watching this on uh, either Facebook or Twitter, not Twitter, uh, or I guess we're streaming it on our own site, um, you can use the hashtag ML Talks. And uh, towards the second part of this uh, conversation, we'll be doing Q&A, and we will try to integrate your questions. Um, today's guest is Jen Fuller, and she is a, uh, a forensics expert. Uh, she has a really amazing story and a really amazing perspective, and I'm really looking forward to her um, conversation. But we will uh, have her come up, and we'll start with a conversation between the two of us where I'll be asking her questions, and we'll, we'll uh, pivot to uh, dialogue with all of you. But um, Jen, you want to come on up? So thank you for coming all this way. You're in from Seattle, right? Thank you for having me. Is your mic is her mic up? Can you say? Even with the mic, my voice is slow. Is is it? I think it's low. There we go. Hello. Okay. Oh, there we are. So <laughs> got it that hey. time. <laughs> so so, um, first of all, I think what might be helpful for everyone is to first explain what a forensics expert is, or digital forensics expert. Okay, so ooh, digital evidence, um, forensics has to do with, in, in my, my job was to do anything with a chip that came into the Redmond Police Department, which is where I worked for 28 years, it was mine to take care of. So I would go on scene with a search warrant, bring back the evidence, um, or it would come in and it was my job to process it, analyze it according to whatever the search warrant allowed me to do and produce reports, uh, go to court, uh, that sort of thing. So that's kind of the bottom line. And, and, uh and maybe can you tell us a little bit about like how you started in this and where you came from? Where I came from. Or sort of both socially and kind of <laughs> literally. <laughs> right. So getting into this field was really a unique opportunity because A, I knew nothing about police work to start with and B, never, never saw myself doing this. But I started with the police department basically as the chief secretary and he at some point said, hmm, you're good at that, you do that. He kept saying that. So first one was doing budgets and grants and I did that. And then one day the team that was running the CAD system um, left for a more lucrative job at a big company in Redmond, maybe starts with an M for Microsoft. And so he said, you're good with computers, you run you can do that, go do that. So with a week's notice, I crammed on Unix and um, somehow managed to only take the system down one time in a year and a half, and that was pretty successful. And I, I enjoyed doing that. And uh, then very, res very right after that, um, one of the officers had an, a, an opening at IASIS, which is the computer investigative school that's really, really great out of Florida and he promoted so couldn't go. So I was told, hey, you're good with computers, you go learn computer forensics. And I literally did not know what I was getting into. I didn't know what it would mean. Uh, when someone mentioned that there were child porn cases, I thought, hey, no, I'll just do fraud, you know, I won't do anything else. Just totally naive about it. And I went to the school, and uh, there were 300 people there. Uh, one of the first assignments, you got a, well, then it was a box on the table in front of you, and we were told to take it apart and put it back together and prove we knew what we were doing. I'd never taken the side off of a computer, so that's how far I had to come. But people were wonderful. I got tutored. I passed the test, the exams. I passed all the cer certifications. I've past all the recertifications, and I've been through tons of training since then, and that's how this happened, so. And, uh, mm -hmm. and, and now, um, what, what are you working on? Uh, well, I retired in April from the police department, and I'm working diligently on a project to address some of the needs in local law enforcement, particularly regarding digital forensics, because there are, Let's see, what's the figure? 
18,000 plus police agencies in the United States right now. I don't know, it might be closer to 20,000. And of those, 73% are agencies of 25 members or less. And you can bet that those agencies don't have their own digital capabilities, and yet every single crime that's committed or observed has some sort of digital component anymore. There's, there's a video of it, there's the actual crime, there's, there's so much. So I want to put together teams that will go out and address and ac according to what a community wants their police department to be doing, maybe uh, just image devices and get them on to someone else or actually do the analysis in order to catch some of the uh, crimes that are affecting the local as well as broader sense of community and uh, so I see those teams as being comprised of a prosecutor. There's a lot of different people who have their have a big role to play in computer forensics and the, the community is part of it. A, a victim's advocate would need to be part of the team so that they could talk to and help find resources for any victims that are located, a community member maybe, uh, certainly forensics experts, um, possibly students or people who've recently certified in computer forensics so, so they get some actual bench time and some experience in what it's like to go out and do this kind of thing. Um, state and local, whoever the partners are that make sense for that agency and that location, I want to bring them together and actually do a boots on the ground. I want to drive a van with uh, equipment in it and um, take care of some issues that right now I think are going, uh, they're, they're languishing. So, uh, you know, I, I, and I, I've been sort of leading up to this part. I mean, uh -huh. I think most, I, most students, when they think of police, they think of people who come and bust their parties. I think lately we think about, you know, police brutality. And I think police kind of get, have a negative image on uh, the minds of many people these days. And, and I think when I talked to you, it was what was really kind of interesting for me is I kind of forgot that police also catch some really bad people too. And, and I think that's, to me, I think was, uh, was kind of an a important um, first step in me understanding your work. And so I thought maybe the, 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 a, a really good place to start would be to talk about one of the cases um, and then describe both you know, how, you, how you did it and we can sort of see what the category of crime is that you go after. So we start with the, uh, the David DeLay case, which right. is, uh, is, is kind of one of your big cases. And I think we have a video of one of the, is it one of the victims? It, it is the victim. She's the one that broke this the whole case open. Okay, mm -hmm. so we'll start with that and then we'll get you to explain the case. He said that I would make $20 million from the documentary and that it was, if porn was legal, then escorting and prostitution should be legal too. And that once it aired or whatever, it, that I would and all the other girls would get $20 million each. When I met them, I was a senior. Um, I was a gymnast and I was doing gymnastics. I wouldn't say I was a shy person in high school, but I didn't really talk about relationships or anything, and so I kind of just went on there to meet people and possibly find a relationship, who knows. I can't remember what she really like said exactly, but I know she was just friendly and kind of pursuing in some way <laughs> that she was a nice person and, you know, actually generally cared and wanted to get to know me. At first they treated me very well. David bought me things and bought coffee and just just treated me like a friend, I should say. Um, like a good friend who you would think was a nice person. They took me to like, I mean, hotels and stuff just for fun at the beginning. I just thought that, oh, I have, have a lot of money and I'll be around people that care about me. I just thought that sounded great. And maybe a month after meeting them, um, it, it 
it kind of got to the point where they slowly introduced the whole escorting or prostitution phase, whatever you want to call it. I think I was kind of just in shock and I didn't really know what to think of it. And I just wanted to be cared about and I wanted a person to care about me and to be loved. So at that point, I, I just didn't really know what to do. I think it was about five or six months after living with them. Um, in November of 2014, I um, called called my mom. She obviously jumped on it of like, oh, you want to come home? Great. And she knew that I needed to get out of the situation. They were they were not there at the time, so that's how I got out. They had scheduled someone, some man, to come over that night. Um, but I had decided before they, before that person comes over, that I was gonna, you know, get on it and actually leave. So that's what I did. So, so, yeah, so tell us a little bit more about yeah. this case. And Well, first of all, yeah. it's this case that got part of the project to go to local agencies kind of started because the parents went to three, if not four, agencies before they came to Redmond. And it, the other agencies didn't have the capacity, didn't actually maybe know that there was something that could be done about this, the type of crime that her Facebook had been hacked into and they were posting things uh, on it. And so it really helps show the gap that there is because the, the parents were frantic to try to get this to stop and to, and to help their daughter. So it came to Redmond and um, luckily we had an officer who recognized that maybe there was something that could be done, turned it over to an investigator and then we were off and, off and running with it. The, the case was, it took a long time, it was several so years in the working. So at this point you didn't know mm -hmm. that how many victims and things, oh, you just no, had her no. story. We just right? had her story and we were getting her, uh, her Facebook page and kind of figuring out. And then with the interviews and then with, I think it was first a phone maybe that came in and I'd have to, to verify, but I think that was the first device that more and more evidence kept coming in of how big this was. And they were all, I'm gonna stipulate their warrants. We're not, we're not just looking at things, but we're looking for things. And pretty quickly, um, I think I did maybe 29 different p types of evidence. There were tons of CDs, there was all kinds of cameras and, computers and cell phones and it pretty quickly emerged that there was this pattern and I believe I'm safe in saying that I probably recognized 500 or more individual victims of which we identified 19 and seven were used as part of that case that went federal. So that's a lot of people. In addition to that piece of it, uh, I think it was probably six months into it, um, I was looking at the evidence on a hard drive and I found an image that I had seen four years earlier in a case that we got that was a, we hadn't been able to solve because the child in that picture, there was no face shot and nothing in the room to indicate who she was. and that picture was on this computer. And once in a while, it's not that you can remember all of the pictures because there's millions of them, but some of them just stick with you because of a particular, you're haunted by it or it just, I don't know what, what it was, but um, so, and there it was. So um, the investigator, whose name is Natalie D'Amico, who did a fabulous job on this case, she and I became kind of obsessed about figuring out who this little girl was, and we 
looked at all the Facebook posts, tried to figure out, okay, does that text go with who this little girl could be? And it wasn't, none, none of it was working until maybe eight months after we found that picture. Um, I had a new device to look at, and I found a picture of the girl as an older child, because it was more current, and she had a school sweatshirt on, and so we were able to identify her. And one of the things David did was um, he encouraged or sometimes uh, coerced women to uh, abuse their children for his benefit and film it, and that had been the case with this child. And so um, out of this case came several other arrests for um, uh, people who were um, abusing their children and other children and filming it for his um, at his request. So that was a particularly satisfying moment to identify her and um, remove her and her siblings from the situation and, um, and you know, hopefully helped. And, and how, how long did this whole investigation take? Ooh, yeah, it, we got it in 2014 and the sentencing was in 2018 of this year. There were a lot of continuances with the case. It went federal, there, there were a lot of reasons. His defense team quit and he fired some and I mean, it took a long time. And so there are hundreds of victims, there's this mm -hmm. one guy or a, mm -hmm. a, a right. couple. How common is this? I mean, how many of these David types do you think there are? Oh, I couldn't give a number, but there, there's a lot. There are. And, and, and are, are these people who were doing it some other way before we had social media and dating sites? I mean, is this a, is this a category of an old category or is this a new category? Well, it's, it's easier to do now. The social media oh. certainly gives a platform, mm -hmm. so. And is it easier or harder to find them? I think it's both. Um, I think you can, sometimes you're lucky when you find some, the, some, the person comes and reports, then you have someone who knows what to do with it, so that part makes it a little bit easier, but sometimes you're thwarted by uh, investigating certain aspects, or you come across, in this case, there were a couple of cell phones that held some really incriminating evidence that were encrypted, and so we had that issue to look at, so mm -hmm. harder, easier. Um, some of it feels like luck, but it's, it, it takes hours to investigate what you can do and what you can try to get, and um, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, it's interesting for me, because I'm usually the digital liberties, privacy, encryption person, mm -hmm. and then here's a great example of a case where you want law enforcement to have access, and I think that's sort of the the, the interesting and tricky thing. I mean, we have a Madaris back there who works with us, and he's working on cryptography that allows certain people to have access to some of the stuff so that maybe you don't have to have the absolute privacy or access to everything. Um, but I, you know, I, I think, I think one, one thing that's really important as we think about sort of technology in the future and, 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 and surveillance is, is, is this process of, of what rights and what warrants and process you have to go through in order to get this. And do you feel like you, first of all, maybe talk about the process, but do you feel like you have sufficient access to do your job? And, and do you think that, um, what, I mean, what, what, what would you, if you could, if you could have what you want? A wanted, little magic wand? <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I don't think that there's sufficient access. It's, you know, sometimes, I don't think anyone should make my job easy. I think I should have to work for it, and, and that's great. But if you can articulate that you know you're going to find a piece of evidence on that device and you can say why you know it because of an exchange of a, um, during a chat that they've said that they're going to do something, then I think a judge should be able to sign a warrant and that it should be decrypted so that you could find the information only related to that. Mm -hmm. Encryption is a problem. That's 500 some plus and that's not even a big case. So. I think it's um, crucial that we do something about the encryption because no one wants their daughter or niece or anybody, or it's not just daughters, it's, it's girls and boys. No one wants to see that. And if we have a good way to both prevent and to stop, um, I, I, to me it's baffling that we can't do that. Mm -hmm. I do think it has to be within limits. Mm -hmm. 
I don't think it should be wide open. I don't think it should be that it's best practice if the, uh, a, a person like with my job, which is the forensics investigator, does and finds what's there according to what the judge has ordered, and I turn that only over to the investigator, so there's no fishing, there's no looking for extra things. Um, to me, it's a good model. And, and how much of your job is, I know, I mean, it's, it's an amazing story that you started as an administrative assistant, yes. and you ended up as an investigator. Um, how much of this is, is like, it's sort of nature versus nurture. How much of this is technology? How much of it is your, your intuition and your passion and your, or, and how much of this is something that people should, that we need more training for, for example? So how much of, um, as my to, investigation Yeah, the ability to it? close these, these very complicated um, cases. Well, I do have a passion for it, and I do like a good problem, and I do like to work towards a solution, so there is, there's that piece of it. Um, it's, not every case worked out very satisfactorily, and sometimes there's a lot of really boring times when you're waiting for something to process, or you think, oh, if I see another zero and one, I'm just going to scream, or what is that? But there's so much satisfaction in going down and actually making a difference by finding a victim or um, and providing services. Um, mm -hmm. it's, it's kind of addic addictive to do that, um, to help. Yeah. 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 And it's a unique way to help. And, and so th we, and I, I, there's another case that you mentioned, oh. um, this Barry McCohen case, because yes. can, you can't talk about all of your cases, obviously, no, but no. you can talk about the ones that are, Sleep. are, are, are have yeah. sufficiently yep. been public, right? Um, can you tell us a little bit about another case? Sure. So uh, Barry McCohen came about because there was a Redmond case of a child, uh, of their, child sex abuse and child porn. And uh, Thompson, I believe, was the name of the suspect in that case. And I finished the Thompson case, finished all my work, but again had one of those images that just wouldn't go get out of my head about who is that, who is that girl? And the, um, the suspect and, and McCohen had been conversing through chat, and it was the most vile, horrific chat content as well as maybe fantasy, but... Um, talk about stealing a child from a playground and using, um, it was uh, Barry McCohen's grandchildren that he was abusing and he was planning to use possibly one of the grandchildren to lure another child and my just, I was obsessed with figuring out who that child was. And there wasn't much way to figure it out because the pictures were, the initial pictures were of a little girl looking out a window. But eventually when I, I found a picture that turned out to be McCohen taking a photo of his granddaughter in the back seat of the car, and he had it in the rear view mirror. And because I've been fortunate to be trained in video forensics as well, I was able to clarify that image and get, I think I just got nine digits of the phone number. And it, but it was easy to figure out who he was because it was a simple, real, actually a Google search and then a Google map search, and in the Google map search with the crime analyst was working with me to do that, and we, we were watching as we came around, and it was the house you could see from the first picture, and then it was the car that he was taking it from, and then there was a wall. It was like, it was the most CSI moment I've ever had in the real, in, in doing this, and um, he did not plead, he, he wanted to go to court, so I went back and testified, and he did, I think he got 55 years, maybe three sets of 55, I mean, it's basically a life sen sentence in Pennsylvania, so um, that, was, that was a very satisfying case, and uh, I think a good outcome. Mm -hmm. and, and are most of these people pretty sophisticated in trying to confound investigations, or? Oh. Sometimes, yes, um, and so again, encryption is a good way that that happens, or using the dark web, or um, it, sometimes I have a theory that the ones that, that we catch are people who don't feel good about themselves for what they're doing, and, may, I, and I don't know, that's just, right. I mean, but, but there are a lot who, you know, mess up, and there's some that we just never get, mm -hmm. and we know that they're out there. Interesting. Um, 
And, and you, you mentioned earlier about sort of, um, uh, you use the term community. You know, I think, oh. um, uh, you know, maybe you can talk a little bit more, more about this, but, I, but I, f I feel like one of the things that, you know, you know, at the Media Lab and others, and we're involved with the ACLU, we're involved with a lot of national level organizations that are fighting against policy level things, and it feels like a lot of the uh, rules that we have around um, what police can and can't do, what surveillance can and can't do, is a result of some sort of big policy argument at a political level. Um, and that uh, community that doesn't seem to have a whole lot of relevance to those people, but, but you, you often mention the word community. I mean, how does community, do you think, relate with um, police? Well, yeah, well, I think you can't, I think you can't get to decrypting phones or get to solving the crimes if you don't gain the trust of the community that you're working at, they have to know that you're not collecting things just for a person, you know, just a massive. And I believe that most agencies are not. They're, that, that's, this is my perspective and from where I've worked. So if you get the trust and they're working with you, then you're working together to solve the problems. I, th I think I was maybe mentioning that um, last week I was at the IECP conference, which is International Association of Chiefs of Police in Orlando, and both the outgoing president, whose name is Lou Deckmar, and the incoming, who's Paul Sell, mentioned a trust initiative that IECP is, is doing in, because we recognize it's a problem, the community knows it's a problem. So they have this initiative, and what was more significant to me, from my interest, is that they both mentioned the digital component to the trust mm -hmm. initiative. and. Um, it's, we, we have to work together. We, we shouldn't be doing something that is against what the community wants. We need to do what the law says, but um, we can mm -hmm. certainly do more. Yeah. We had a, a, a speaker named Claude Steele, um, who was a provost at Berkeley, but he's well known for um, uh, thinking about diversity on campuses and things like that. And one of the things that he said, uh, which is sort of interestingly relevant, um, is that um, with the increasing diversity um, and, uh, you know, there's traditionally faculty are tough on students. And if you're all kind of from the same community, th that, that people interpret that toughness in the right way as kind of like tough love. But when you have a very diverse population and you haven't built up the trust and there's reason for mistrust because of sort of societal things that you really need to invest in building trust before you can have a even a functioning academic system. And so, so he was really um, uh, urging us as well as sort of campuses um, to, to, to focus on this trust building. And the trust building had a lot to do, he said, with actually talking about race, talking about identity, talking about the issues rather than just kind of pretending that it's okay. And I feel like right now, um, society, we have a lot of mistrust right now. We're very polarized and, um, and uh, you know, connecting to community, because I think it's easy to say, uh, okay, well, let's build trust in the community, but like, what, how, how, do, how do you do that? Well, personally, I think you have to meet people. I think you don't just need to talk about it. I yep. think you actually actively have to go out there and know your neighbors and empathize with them, um, just to get to know them and know them as human beings. You don't have to agree with them, but share your ideas that way, but mm -hmm. just talking doesn't do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we, I mean, I think, and I think functioning neighborhoods, I think, have that. And I think mm -hmm. the, 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 I think for, you know, I, I was just last, I guess it was last week, a week before last, we were, I was in Chicago, mm -hmm. um, where um, I'm on the board of the MacArthur Foundation. We're trying to um, help d different towns. And, and there's some towns that we, we've seen really turn around in exactly this thing. And it's often somebody from the local community who's, taken on this task of creating a community center and, and, and building that conversation. But, um, um, but, but, do you, but do you, I mean, because I've never, never been to a conference of chiefs of police before, but um, I mean, do, 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 you, do you sense that, they, that they're all uh, equipped and able to start this process? I absolutely think that they are. And I hear more and more talk at those conferences about the need to, there, I don't know anyone that doesn't want this to happen mm -hmm. uh, and, and doesn't want to serve their community. Um, 
sometimes maybe they're bound by a law or, or whatever, but I believe they truly want that. Mm -hmm. And the other thing I want to say about building trust is that you really first have to look at yourself and make sure that what you're doing inside yourself is respectful to anyone before you require anyone else to do it. It really does start with, with the you. Mm -hmm. and, so, and so getting back to sort of your initiative and also mm -hmm. kind of um, um, what are practical things that, so, so we're not everyone here, but most of us are, are technologists. We're, we, we work with uh, some of the uh, platforms. We kind of take them to task sometimes mm -hmm. on things, and we, you know, we have a lot of opinions. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, what, what, what do you think for the technical communities? The, what, how can we help? Yeah, I think there's a lot of ways to be, um, to integrate with law enforcement and what they're trying to do, so because there's improvement to be made with programs out there there's um, and to to do research so that um, because a lot of law enforcement is not technical Shh, don't tell anybody that <laughs> <laughs> so they need help with the research they need help developing what is actually good product otherwise they rely on what they buy off the shelf for example versus a really thoughtful yeah. Uh, and not that some off the shelf isn't good, but um, it, there needs to be more interaction that way. And you can definitely make a difference with adding what you can do with, um, you know, the gaps in what law enforcement is able to do. Yeah, actually, I, I, one of the companies that we are sometimes critical of um, that does the risk scores uh, for uh, uh, the criminal justice system. Um, you know, we recently found out that they, they go to the, the, actually that conference of chiefs of police and mm -hmm. it's like they have like a, a booth and, uh -huh. and they sell this thing. And I was talking to actually a chief of police who had bought the software and they had signed some agreement that said that um, they, didn't, they, they didn't have to disclose the, the data. Um, they didn't have to disclose close their algorithm. And it was basically a, a confidentiality agreement, um, which they signed um, without really thinking about what the out what the what the second order effect is which is if the risk score does something and contributes to an unfair sentence or an unfair parole uh, or bail um, that you can't um, subpoena that in court you know and I think the um, you know just to, I, I, and, and it's interesting because the, the 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 types of people who kind of think about these things don't go to the conferences yes. where um, these guys are are handing out their flyers and and, and so on and so um, interestingly, I, I, I got one of the chiefs of police uh, magazines the other day and mm -hmm. just was flipping through looking at the ads. It's kind of scary. And I think I feel like, mm -hmm. um, it, you know, we can sit here in our armchair and kind of point fingers at jurisdictions for buying software or signing agreements that I think aren't, aren't great for justice. But we need to sort of meet uh, where, where that's happening. And, and this police chief said, well, you, you guys need to show up at these conferences if you have an opinion, because that's yeah. where the deals are being made. And um, is that, do you, is that, is that, I mean. I think you should show up at the conferences and talk about what you can do or, you know, how to work, work together. Listen to the presentations and listen to the opinions and understand where each is coming from. So maybe I'll send Andy. <laughs> but um, that, so, but I, and then the, I think because I think that's that's my my concern is that you know and we like we we are we have a, a faculty member here at MIT named Ron Rivest who's very anti um, uh, 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 electronic voting and I think the problem is once you start to get companies who build these voting machines it's very hard to fight against them because they've now become a business and I think that um, a lot of the uh, software that I see that I think are I have concerns with, they're starting to build businesses. And I think that you know, one of the things as researchers um, that want to figure out tools that both protect privacy but also enable uh, law enforcement to do what they want, I, I think that's, 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 that's maybe really important. Um, but, w and, but this ties to one of the questions that I push back that I get from local law enforcement and, and local government is, well, we, they don't have the resources. They, 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 mm -hmm. they don't, you know, you tell them they better, they can write their own software or they should, you know, understand what's going on. Um, and you just happen to be so-called good with computers, but um, I mean, how much? What, what's the right way to fix that? Is it is it a money issue? Is it is it skills? I mean, is that an area we can help? Well, uh, skills definitely, money of course, but it's resources, not just it's resources in understanding the issues as well. There's there's a lot of ways to to make a shift there and. 
get people to understand, get people to, to then know what can be written and, you know, working collaboratively, right? Mm -hmm. It's, um, so with uh, that 73% of agencies 25 and under, do you think they have resources to do their own software? To even, I mean, they're lucky to get a piece of software sometimes. It's, um, it, it's hard and they're, they're working on really small budgets and they may want to, it's, life has changed, policing has changed and trying to integrate technology, mm -hmm. it's hard. And, and, I, and I asked a version of this question earlier and you, you gave me a kind of a, de it depends answer, but a, lo a lot of the, the digital privacy people argue that uh, police have more tools than ever before and they just want more. Um, but they have plenty of tools to do what they need. Would you disagree with that? Or, or do you think that maybe at the federal level they do, but at the local level they well, don't? Or? you know, I can't really exactly answer that because I don't know what tools they're talking about. But even if you have a lot of tools, like let's say you've tried four things and none of them work, it just means they didn't work. It doesn't mean that you're collecting more and more. It just means it didn't get you the outcome mm -hmm. that you were expecting. So, yeah. And so I don't know what tools they're meaning, but... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I can keep going as well, but I don't know if anybody here has uh, questions. I'm happy to start opening it up to question. Agnes, and we have a microphone Nerf box that we'll send you. Can you... Uh, oh. <laughs> wow. <laughs> <laughs> Can you revisit the wish list question? You know, given your understanding of what you find difficult to do, what kinds of tools do you wish you had to make your job easier, better, faster? I wish I had more tools that could weed out, um, you, you can weed out some known images, the hash values and that sort of thing. I wish I had tools to go through video even faster. I, I know a lot of companies are working on that, but that's, that's one. Um, I wish I had a tool that would automatically validate my equipment because it's time consuming to go through and validate. So every time you do an exam, you test your equipment to make sure that there's, everything's operating correctly and that the software is updated, blah, 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 blah. It's very time consuming. I'd love to have a tool that would automate that process. And um, those are a couple just off the top of my head. Um, Hi, Dan. Um, I'm really interested to know what you think about kind of open sourced and crowdsourced investigations, particularly online investigations. So a famous example really recently is the Bellingcat investigation into the Sergei Skripal case. I, can't I don't know quite if you hear can, can you say oh. that again? Um, ah. Oh, sorry. Um, I'm interested to know what you think about um, open sourced and crowdsourced mm -hmm. investigations. Mm -hmm. So famously recently, the Bellingcat case which was investigating the Skripals um, poisoning, managed to trace one of the suspects to being a military doctor in Russia. Um, yeah, what do you think about kind of citizen governed tools for investigation and forensics? Go for it, it's open source. <laughs> if it's available and legal, great. <laughs> I use open source tools for, for validation, et cetera, yeah. Do you, do you actively engage communities in your work, though? I mean, have I ever asked someone to help me? You mean? I guess that's a version of the I mean, question. I, mean, I, I, I guess the question is maybe, and I, I don't even know the answer to this. But are there, are there communities of people who do this somewhat as a hobby that connect with you, or maybe um, they're even like there may maybe I don't know. I can imagine like Mothers Against X Y Z or some, something like that as well. But uh, are there citizen efforts that that that, that are organized in you a know, way? I don't know exactly about digital. I don't know that a request has come out, but we do, you know, request if you know anything about this case. So see, it could I come see, about that the way. The lost, it's possible lost it could come thing. out yeah. that way, but I don't know that anyone ever provided me with yeah. actual tips that... Um, so, so, so it could be yeah. that we could design something that looked like a way for people to mm. participate in helping something and I think, I think that the, the trick, and there's the, recently right now, there's the, um, um, what's it, the, the, 
the, the, the shitty men in media list, I think is, the, I don't know if you've been tracking that, but there was a, a list, a, 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 a Google spreadsheet that a woman um, uh, shared with other women to uh, anonymously share and create a list of media men in New York um, who were sort of shitty in whatever ways, and it described their sort of their, their pattern. And it was to help the other women on the list protect themselves from getting caught in a situation where they were being taken advantage of the men. So the initial, I think the initial idea was actually probably very well intended and um, really to support the women. But what happened, as you can imagine, is because of its anonymous nature, um, it was started to leak out. And, um, and then it got bigger. And then the people who were on the list now, one of the people is suing the woman who started the list. And it's also become so-called weaponized, because now people are going after all the men on the list. But it's this kind of interesting thing where um, I think that, um, again, it depends on the category of crime right now with Me Too. I think that's, a, that's an interesting, um, it's, it's a, it has a, a, has a likelihood to turn into something that was unintended. But, but, but I guess one question would be, is there a way to sort of figure out how you might crowdsource evidence or other things and to keep it from turning into something that grows into something you can't control. I, I did think of, a, of an example that I, I think it was two months ago, a young woman went missing in the mountains near Seattle. And the family has been looking, the search and rescue was out, the dog and everything, and nothing was located. And they did a really cool thing because they put up drones and then they put all that data in the cloud for anyone who was interested and had time to go through because there was such a huge amount of data. So that's an excellent resource for saying, yes, there's nothing here and that would point the searchers towards what they thought was a code. They, as far as I know, they haven't located her, but it's a perfect way for technology yeah. to be used for and, and I suppose searching for missing people is pretty unpolitical and something that you could probably get people to do without hopefully not turning it into some um, weird thing. Um, but but is, there, is, there, is there anybody actively thinking about this? Or, and if there isn't, what would be the appropriate group to do that? Or should we just do it, I guess? Well, I think it's a great project, and I think it would be something good to put out and ask anyone at IECP. Or, I don't know if there's anyone working on anything like mm -hmm. that there, mm -hmm. but um, it wouldn't surprise me. And yeah. you know, putting together a. I mean, I think the other um, thing, you know, this reminds me of. So at, at um, we, you know, mm -hmm. we have this Title IX um, process, which mm -hmm. is this process, as you know, but for the people who don't, even at MIT, if somebody tells me an issue that involves uh, a sexual harassment. I'm required to report it to the central Title IX officer. And the reason for that, which is kind of an obvious one in retrospect, is that sometimes it's one person doing multiple uh, uh, crimes. And so if there's no central point, you can't actually see the whole picture. So it may look like one incident, and you kind of cover it up. But it turns out that if everybody reports it, you can see the pattern. And, um, but people don't like to talk about these things, and you have to keep confidentiality. So one kind of interesting way, and again, you have to prevent it somehow from being gamed, but if there was a way to confidentially and securely provide signals so that you could see, and again, I think you'd have to figure out that a way to not have that become an attack on a person right. that could be orchestrated. But, but one of the problems that you said was these jurisdictions make it so difficult to even get a case started. Well, there's that piece. And there's also, if you have, if everyone is going to look for evidence, let's say, if, it, if there's any possibility that they alter the evidence inadvertently, I mean, you have yep. to be really careful that what you collect, you're able to document that is true and accurate, so mm -hmm. you would have to build into your system something that if you were having a group try to look for something that they're not actually spoiling the evidence. Right, right, right. Yeah, and I guess the last thing you want is people running around and it's it, like they show in the movies and just... Yeah, stepping across the stepping crime, crime scene. <laughs> the blood's tracked all over. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Although recently, I mean, I think it's interesting seeing like Icarus is, is a case. I know there's another film that I'm, I'm so, so perfectly involved in that involves doing um, a documentary 
Mm-hmm. That so so Icarus was really interesting because it was this documentary just on doping and and riding in general. They stumble on this Russian guy. They contact the New York Times, great paper by the way, New York Times, and then <laughs> and then they involve law enforcement and it turns into a, a big big deal. And it was a interesting case where um, you know you go from media to to uh, to law enforcement, and I think that um, and I think that the thing is, and this is why it's a little thing, a little different than pure amateur that. I think people who do documentaries in this, this space, and the, you know, I, they have slightly different interests than law enforcement, but they're, they're, they're a single source and relatively yes. sophisticated, mm-hmm. so you can mm-hmm. kind of have a negotiation with them, whereas kind of a big crowd is probably harder, right? Right. Um, right. Any, any other? Okay, we've got a couple. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, hi. Um, is there a certain kind of like record or piece of data that you'd really like to be useful to you, but you don't have a tool or Sorry, there's I no precedence? Quite. My ears maybe. Oh, is it not loud enough? Mm-hmm. Is that better? Yeah, yeah the um, sound quality is a little bit echoey, so yeah. maybe say it. Yeah. Okay, sorry. Is there a particular type of record or data that you would really like to be useful to you, but you don't have a tool or there's no precedence in using? And would you tell people if you... <laughs> <laughs> I think that would be case by case basis, really. You know, sometimes it's not like we'll use metadata, for example. It wouldn't be relevant to this case, might be to another, and that you would want a tool that would extract more of that or be able to read more of that. That's, I'm not sure exactly if that's what you're asking, but um, it would be case specific for me right now. And this one back there, you wanna, or you've got there. Go ahead, if you have it. Uh, do you think this? Do you think decentralized platforms could be a solution for further engaging citizens in the community through crowdsourcing and possibly incentivizing contribu- cr- contributions to investigations? Okay, well, I'm sorry, but again, it kind of comes garbled, and yeah. I can't distinguish what you're. Okay. Do you think decentralized platforms could be a solution for further engaging citizens in the community through crowdsourcing and incentivizing contributions to investigations? Yeah, so de- possible. Yeah. Yeah. So do you want to describe a decentralized platform as an example? Mm-hmm. Um, like blockchain, for example. Like block- blockchain? Um, I still don't have a, a good feel for how to answer that question because I'm not sure that I understand it. Yeah. So. Yeah, and I think, I mean, one of the things, for example, that um, I mean, we're working on it at, in our digital currency initiative is uh, decentralized markets or places okay. where, I mean, I, 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 my, my guess is that they probably overall increase crime more than they help solve crimes, at least in the short run. Um, but um, but I, I, th- I think, and, and you're talking about providing incentives as well, right? So, so it's, it, I think part of this would be, um, and, and I have talked to some law enforcement about um, how they're using um, decentralized platforms and, and things like um, digital currencies uh, to contact and interact with people in ways that they couldn't do before. Um, but you're, it's not something that you've... you've it's not you know. something that I've personally worked on, but I love the idea. Yeah, mm-hmm. and, you know, and I'll, I'll say just from a digital currency initiative perspective, um, I've talked to one uh, compliance officer of a major uh, exchange who used to be the compliance officer of a major bank and she says that it's now easier to find bad guys um, because you can look at the blockchain and see everything everybody is doing. And so, so one of the things I think that's, and, and again, people like Madaris are working on more private blockchain technology to try to inhibit this. But um, right now the blockchain is actually f- feels private because you don't necessarily know who the account holders are, but isn't very private in that you can actually analyze the patterns of most of the transactions and kind of identify who the fraudsters are. And I think that's going to be a constant um, battle that we're doing. Again, this sort of it com- does end up into where you go, which is how much privacy do we need to provide versus how much access do we need to provide? And, and one of the fears that I have is that um, a lot of countries are talking about blockchain for the poor people as a way to uh, you know, unbank the, un- the bank the unbanked. And the worst thing that could possibly happen is that only poor people are completely visible to everybody and rich people have other ways of sending their money. And so the far end of completely uh, visible, I think, is, is dangerous. On the other hand, the completely private one has its own obvious challenges. Um, but I think, I think that's, that's something we're going to be um, seeing in real time soon. And I think if you worked with 
talk to people in law enforcement about how they would, what they would need to investigate specifically and see the whys of it, then, then you would know what to, you know, how to develop maybe differently that could still serve the social good as well as protect uh, privacy. Uh, oh, go ahead. Sort of following on that public-private tension, there seems to be like a really big disconnect between what you're talking about and the need for public buy-in and community trust on one hand and sort of what you're talking about in terms of the extreme privacy of black box algorithms like risk scores, predictive policing. Uh, so I was wondering, uh, A, have you had sort of successful examples of getting community buy-in to some of these very private technologies? And B, are there more sort of open source or other types of some of the technological software work that you're looking for that do, don't follow that sort of private company black box model uh, that facilitates that sort of co uh, community buy-in? Yeah. Well, uh, we, we in uh, the local law enforcement, we don't use anything we can't validate or get ourselves. So we're not going to get data from... Um, hmm. If I heard you correctly, we're not we're we're getting data through sources that were approved to get it through pretty much and and validating it. So it's did, did that answer the question or speak to it enough or maybe there's more to, there's more to it. Yeah, and and um, um, yeah, I, I I think I think there's there's a couple pieces. I, I do think what's what's interesting is. Um, Oh. How you have that conversation? Oh, this is useful. How you have that conversation in the community? Because I think one of the mm. problems is, and, and I know Madaris wants to speak, so maybe he can address this as well. Is that um, you can do a lot more with the technology than the vendors tell you. And so, for instance, you can have privacy that's only available, for instance, if these three institutions, including your church, uh, say okay. Yeah. So, for instance, you could have a category of warrant that um, only unlocks this particular data set if these three other groups say okay. I mean, so, so, so I think if, if the community sort of designed what kind of privacy they wanted and said we want to build this and they could work with an academic institution like MIT or they could work with, a, with some other philanthropist or something, but you could probably design something that was much more nuanced to do exactly what you want rather than here's a package, here's a vendor, take it or leave it, which is kind of what the, the problem that we have. And, and, and there's actually a great, um, there's a Wired article about this um, recently, um, but one of our, 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 my colleagues, um, uh, Ray Ozzi, uh, who, who's you know, one of the founders of Lotus, um, he, he had made a very controversial set of statements saying that he thought that we should rethink the end-to-end -end encryption problem and that we should think about whether there was a way to technically make it possible to um, decrypt things and, and that, that he wasn't, he, he thought that we were being too absolutist on end-to-end -end encryption and he got flamed like crazy as you can imagine because it's almost like, it's almost a religious dogma right now among um, my, my community that end-to-end that -end encryption shall not be breached. Um, but I talked to him about this and he remembers way back during the clipper chip days and I was also uh, uh, fighting uh, um, for encryption back then. What happened was when we were able to show that we could do digital encryption, what the US government did is they cut a deal with the telcos and said, okay, fine, you can do digital encrypt all you want. We'll just pass CALEA, which is a law that basically built a backdoor into all the telephone companies and said, we can't put alligator clips on anymore. So every telephone company has to give a, a, an ability for digital wiretaps. And so what they did by, by making the middle secure, they forced the government to do an end run, which actually is what led to more of these sweeping um, uh, surveillance things. So I think it's an inter interesting other meta point, which is I think as a community, we tend to not want to even have the conversation of having a conversation with law enforcement. And I think that, that, I, I think that it might be actually very fruitful. And I, I see yeah. the question written out here now. So there are successful examples of getting community buy-in, and really it has to do with license plate readers, for example. Some communities hated the idea, said no, no, no. Some of them love it, and so they have them. So that's one piece of technology that um, was pretty community-centric um, for... I, I didn't know we had them here, and so we, I had my, the tags on my, my license plate were expired, and my wife wanted to go 
to the store to get something important. I said, oh, we'll get them um, replaced when you get back. And then I ended up in, in, in um, <laughs> spending a day in, in, in remedial um, light. Well, <laughs> so I learned well, the hard way. <laughs> well, one of the frustrating things about this is that there are private companies driving around doing um, uh -huh. with license plate readers, doing the parking enforcement and everything. But law enforcement can't get the data from them. So even if we have a homicide or we have someone we know is there, we can't get the data to know that that person was really there. It is not possible. Oh, it's done. So it's, uh, it's a little bit of an encryption, and um, it's mm -hmm. probably not what the community intended, but yeah. it is the truth of it. That's so. really interesting. Same with uh, bridges that capture your uh, license plate to go over for the tolls mm -hmm. and everything. So you're looking for someone, or you're looking for uh, someone who's stolen a child or something. You aren't going to get it. Oh, interesting. So. Um. I'm a cryptographer, so I'm going to ask a not cryptographic question, which is, can you speak a little bit about the human component of doing those investigations? It must be like really emotionally taxing to just look at child abuse images all day long, and obviously people get ma paid more in industry, so uh, where do people in law enforcement find meaning and purpose to keep doing this? Well, I can't speak generally about law enforcement, but I can speak about myself. And I definitely have been traumatized by looking at millions and millions of images. And not just, sometimes it was the things adults did to each other that was just as traumatic. It's not all about child sex crimes that's hard to see. And I believe that I, if I'm going to do a good job doing what I'm drawn to do, which is try to find the victims, try to make things better, then I need to keep myself healthy. So I, um, you know, I meditate, I go to a psychologist when I need to, to take care of myself, because there is definitely a toll. Anybody else? I shouldn't admit that in public. Is that? <laughs> Too late. I just admitted nope. it in public. Sure. <laughs> Easy. You mentioned the dark web. Um, I imagine that ma makes your job much difficult, much more difficult than now. So what has the police enforcement uh, done to like so the first deal with that, with the dark web? How do we the deal with it? Yeah. How do we deal with the dark web? Well, there are some tools out there that, um, and if you have a dark web case, you're not entirely cut off from getting information if you're allowed to, to, to look for it. Um, but it's incredibly limiting, and pretty much most of the time you say, I'm not going to get to anything here, but you still try, you might find a few little fragments or something, or... And, and again, do you, do you ever find... That's from the local perspective, that the other people this, might... This gets back a little bit to the crowdsourcing, but I remember when yes. um, Anonymous um, would actually take action against what, who they thought were bad guys, but do you ever have hacker groups or others hmm. come and try to ha help you with things? I have not, um, and in some of the cases where in the, the dark web is, I, 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 I can't quote the statistic, but it's big. The number of cases related to child pornography and child abuse hosted on the dark web. In order to view the information and view the pictures, you actually have to provide new content. So it's creating this new world of, of ugliness. I wish that someone could do something about it. Law enforcement can't because you could never, you could investigate, but you could never actually create a new victim in order to get into the club. So um, you would never want to do that. I mean, it's, it's, the whole thing's wrong. Huh, interesting. We've got one here, if you want to. Uh, we, we, we toss you catch it? <laughs> I love that little box. Huh? <laughs> That's a cool little it's box. A, yeah. <laughs> Hi. Hi, I'm a lawyer interested in privacy issues. What are some of the uh, techniques you use to decrypt things where you don't have a warrant for decryption? And uh, do you think that the so-called backdoors for uh, encryption is the right way, or would you suggest um, another way? Well, first of all, I don't think of it as a backdoor. I, don't, I think there needs to be an avenue that through a valid warrant, 
a phone can be unlocked, let's just say phone and not, not anything else. It's not really a back door because you know that the, uh, probably it can already be done. So it's not like people are creating something for law enforcement to get in. Law enforcement doesn't have to hold the key. We just need to be able to go somewhere that can say that this, and decrypt that phone for us. It's, it's nothing about, I want to hold the data, I want to see it all. Um, so it's, it's not leaving a back door for law enforcement. Mm -hmm. And, and what are some of the technical uh, ways, I mean, I know you can't get too much into it, but what are some of the uh, techniques that a law enforcement agency who doesn't have a warrant um, for the suspect to say, um, for example, the San Bernardino Apple case, um, what are some of the ways the, the law enforcement agency would go about trying to decrypt uh, a device? Well, you, you, can, you can talk to the suspect and see if they'll give it to you. You might be able to, de um, there, there's not much choice you have. Uh, you're pretty much stuck if, if, depending on the model of phone, I mean, the earlier phones you can, uh, you might have access to, but um, you're, just, you're just done. And, and I, think, I think if you look at the uh, market for uh, uh, services that, that you can get somebody to do unlocking of phones, um, again, this is just a rough number, but I was talking to somebody who, who's in this field, and he said that you know, the previous generations of iPhones, you could, you could pay somebody $30,000 to basically break, break into it. And now it's gone up to probably close to a million dollars to break into a locked phone, if, 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 if you can. And, and there's, there are RFPs at that level out there. So it, I think one of the things that's happened is that the new encryption has just made it more, very much more expensive. Like, if you go onto the internet, you can see videos of, um, uh, of, of um, some Chinese hardware hackers who just shave off the back of the CPU and can get access to a phone. So it's not impossible, it just costs a lot more money. And so at the federal level, you could probably afford a million dollars to get into a phone. At the FBI level, it would be very hard to do that. And so, so there, there are still vendors out there who, who do this. And, and when I think about operational security for people like at the New York Times or some of our nonprofits, um, one of the things that happens when you start to increase the cost of getting into these things is you just push the attack vector to a different place. So now it's cheaper to kidnap somebody and torture them than it is to steal a phone and crack it. So, we don't do that. We do not so, do that. I mean, I'm, this is, I'm talking about bad actors <laughs> in overseas. I don't, think, I don't think they would do that in Redmond. But, um, but, 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 I, but I do think that, that it, it, that's one of the other problems that it does is it just pushes things around. Um, and also, I, I will say, and again, this gets back to some of the encryption work. I mean, there are ways to, for instance, um, ask a system uh, uh, a question that it can validate as true or false, or or you can you can get ways for machines to give certain types of information to certain people, but protect other types of information. And so, so I think if we start to break down privacy and say, okay, law enforcement, what exactly do you need, and when would you need it, and in what form? And for instance, if you could validate whether is this phone number in the contact list of this phone. That could be possibly tremendously valuable. And if you needed a, a warrant and you need a key and you can verifiably check this number against this number or check two, two lists, this is I think a common zero knowledge proof thing, you take two lists, two phones, and see how many numbers are shared in the context list of, between these two phones. That reveals very little uh, usable privacy information and you can't really go phishing that easily, but you might be able to then connect to a suspect. So there, there might be, again, this gets to the community thing, what is it that you need, what, what, and, and there might be some sort of middle ground in the technology, I think. And, and technology is changing and evolving. You have to have a plan to keep moving and uh, keep the middle ground mm -hmm. as it evolves. So, mm -hmm. so on that note, I think we're out of time, and thank you very much, thank Jen. You. And I hope to uh, thank you. Thank you very much.